angels sing. And I expect to help them make the courts of heaven ring. But when I sing redemption story, they will fold their wings. For angels never felt the joy. Praise the Lord. God is good. And all the time, God is so good. Today is our community guest day. And my heart is rejoicing to see many visiting friends. I'd like to give a special welcome to all my friends from Linden, all my friends from Brooklyn SDA, to my co-worker from the Brooklyn Hospital Center, Jay, and everyone else who has come today. God bless you all. Today's message is a very solemn one, but we are living in solemn times. Jesus is soon to come and all the signs foretell that. So I'm asking if there's anyone in the congregation which does not have a Bible, if someone can either lend them their Bible or individuals share. Is there someone who does not have a Bible? Everyone has a Bible? Praise the Lord. The message for today is entitled, The Unpardonable Sin. Let us pray. Loving Father in heaven, we thank thee for this thy Sabbath day. I just ask now that as your message will be spoken, that you would use me, let self be crucified, and let Jesus alone be uplifted. Bless our hearts and let the Holy Spirit be in our midst as your word is spoken. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Let us open our Bibles and turn to Matthew chapter 12. Matthew chapter 12. We'll be reading from verse 22. When it is found, please say amen. amen. Reading. Then was brought unto him, which is Jesus, one possessed with a devil, blind and dumb, and he healed him, insomuch that the blind and dumb both spake and saw. Amen? Amen. Isn't Jesus wonderful? Amen. Jesus just went about doing wonderful works. When people were oppressed, Jesus healed them from all their sicknesses. And it says in verse 23, And all the people were amazed and said, is not this the son of David? See, they knew, reading the Old Testament, the scriptures that the Messiah would come from the lineage of David. So when they see these miracles, they're saying to themselves, is not this the son of David? Could this be the blessed Messiah who we've been waiting for? And it was, amen? But when the Pharisees heard it, they said, this fellow doth not cast out devils, but by Beelzebub, the prince of the devils. And Jesus knew their thoughts and said unto them, Every kingdom divided against itself is brought to desolation, and every city or house divided against itself shall not stand. And if Satan cast out Satan, he is divided against himself. How, then, how shall then his kingdom stand? And if I, by Beelzebub, cast out devils, by whom do your children cast them out? Therefore, they shall be your judges. Do you see how their claim was totally false? Yes. Now, the message today is the unpardonable sin. Now, this is a sin which is very serious. So notice what the Pharisees did. The Pharisees attributed to Jesus his miracle work in power to the devil. Now, it, by them doing that, they sinned against the Holy Ghost because Jesus cast out the devil by the power of the Holy Spirit. 
So these Pharisees, which were the religious leaders, they were so close their hearts, they were so stubborn and refused to resist. They were continually resisting the Holy Spirit so much so that they could make that claim. And by them saying that, they committed the unpardonable sin. So Jesus says, but if I cast out devils by the Spirit of God, then the kingdom of God is come unto you. Or else, how can one enter into a strong man's house and spoil his goods except he first bind the strong man and then he will spoil his house? Does anyone know who the strong man in this verse Jesus is speaking about? It is Satan. Let us go to Isaiah chapter 14. Isaiah chapter 14. And we will see why their claim was so false. Isaiah chapter 14. Just to get the background, we'll read from verse 14. This is talking about Satan. In Isaiah 14, we'll read from verse 14. It says, I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the Most High. Yet thou shalt be brought down to the hell, to the sides of the pit. They that see thee shall narrowly look upon thee and consider thee, saying, is this the man that made the earth to tremble, that it shake kingdoms, that made the world as a wilderness and destroyed the cities thereof, that what? Open not the house of his prisoners. Notice that. Satan does not open the house of his prisoners. If someone is demon-possessed, Satan wants them to be demon-possessed because the devil has a hold on that person. And that person can be lost. So the devil does not open his doors to the prisoners. Now let's go to Luke chapter 4. Satan does not let them out. Luke chapter 4 verse 18. Luke 4 verse 18. This is Jesus speaking. Luke 4 verse 18 says, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. The Holy Spirit is upon Jesus because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives. Jesus preached deliverance to the captive. Jesus can heal people and let those who are demon possessed be no longer demon possessed by the power of the Holy Spirit. Today's message has everything to do with the Holy Spirit. Now let's go back to Matthew chapter 12 as we continue reading Matthew chapter 12 verse 30. It says, He that is not with me is against me, and he that not gathereth not with me scattereth of world. Wherefore I say unto you, all manner of sin and blasphemy shall be forgiven unto men, but the blasphemy against the Holy Ghost shall not be forgiven unto men. This is serious. Amen. This sin against the Holy Ghost shall not be forgiven unto men. So we need to know what this sin is. Amen? Amen. Because does, none of us would want to commit this sin. Because a person who has committed the sin of blasphemy against the Holy Spirit or the unpardonable sin will be lost. And there is nothing, not even Jesus, can do to save that person. It is that serious. But notice it says, all manner of sin and blasphemy. Let us find out what is blasphemy. John chapter 10. The book of John chapter 10. We'll read from verse 30. John chapter 10, verse 30. Reading, this is Jesus saying, I and my Father are one. Then the Jews took up stones again to stone him. Jesus answered them, Many good works I have showed thee from my Father. For which of those works do you stone me? The Jews answered him saying, For a good work we stone thee not, but for blasphemy, and because thou, because that thou being a man, Makest thyself God. 
a human being claiming for themselves to be God or claiming the attributes of God is blasphemy. Amen. That is blasphemy. Yeah. Now let's go to Matthew chapter 26 and look at this once again. Matthew chapter 26. This is Jesus before Caiaphas. Matthew chapter 26, and we will read from verse 63. Matthew 26, verse 63. Well, let's read from 62. And the high priest arose and said unto him, Answers thou nothing? What is it which these witnesses against thee? But Jesus held his peace, and the high priest answered and said unto him, I abjure thee by the living God, that thou tell us whether thou be the Christ, the Son of God. Jesus saith unto him, Thou hast said. Nevertheless, I say unto you, Hereafter shall ye see the Son of Man sitting on the, cloud, on the right hand of power, and coming in the clouds of heaven. Then the high priest rent his clothes, saying, He hath spoken blasphemy. What further need have we of witnesses? Behold, now ye have heard his blasphemy. So Jesus said, Thou hast said, saying, You answered correctly, I am indeed God. And Caiaphas said, Blasphemy. But notice we, we learn in Matthew chapter 12 that blasphemy is against the Holy Spirit. So how can a human being commit blasphemy by this? The first commandment says, Thou shalt have no other gods before me. But if a person says, I don't need to listen to anyone. No one can tell me what to do. I will live my own life. It doesn't matter if my life is in accordance, in not accordance with God's word, or if anyone tells me anything. I will do my own will. So therefore, I make myself a god because I am subject to no one. Now, the Holy Spirit is, the God, is God who is supposed to dwell in our hearts and lead us into the path of righteousness. But if we exalt self whereby the Holy Spirit cannot come in, that is blasphemy against the Holy Ghost. Because He is to lead our lives, but you are leading your own life, which will be a life of selfishness, which is blasphemy against the Holy Ghost. Now let's go to Ezekiel chapter 28. And let's see an example of that. Ezekiel chapter 28. That's in the Old Testament. Ezekiel. Ezekiel chapter 28. We'll read from verse 1. The word of the Lord came again unto me, saying, Son of man, say unto the prince of Tyrus, Thus saith the Lord God, Because thine heart is lifted up, and thou hast said, I am a God. God. Blasphemy. I sit in the seat of God, in the midst of the seas, yet thou art a man and not God, though thou hast set thine heart as the heart of God. Mankind exalting self, claiming for themselves to be God, you can take, no one can tell you anything, I am subject to no one. Blasphemy against God the Holy Ghost. Now let's go back to Matthew chapter 12. We're just going through the passage. So we saw in verse 31, all manner of sin and blasphemy shall be forgiven, but the blasphemy against the Holy Ghost shall not be forgiven. We've learned what is blasphemy, amen? And we saw that in Ezekiel 28. And whosoever speaketh the word against the Son of Man, it shall be forgiven him. But whosoever speaketh against the Holy Ghost, it shall not be forgiven him, neither in this world, neither in the world to come. Now, it's a sin against the Holy Spirit. And this is so serious because the Holy Spirit is God. Amen. Amen. The Holy Spirit is as much God as Jesus is God. The Holy Spirit is as much God as God the Father is God. Now, I'm going to show you that from Scripture just in case you didn't know because this is vital. 1 John 5, verse 7. 1 John 5, verse 7. Revelation is the last book of the Bible. Then you have Jude, 3rd, 2nd, 1 John. 
We're going to 1 John 5, verse 7. 1 John 5, verse 7 says, For there are three that bear record where? In heaven, the Father, the Word. Who is the Word? Jesus Christ. John 1, 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. John 1, 14 says, And the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. Jesus Christ is the Word. So we have the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost. And these three are one. We saw in John 10, verse 30, when, Je when Jesus said, I and my Father are one, they went to stone him for blasphemy. So Jesus is one with the Father, who is God. The Holy Spirit is in the same passage here, all three separate individual persons, all who are God. Amen? Amen? The Holy Spirit is God. Now let's go to one other text, Acts chapter 5. Acts chapter 5. Acts chapter 5, reading from verse 1. This is about Ananias and Sapphira. Does anyone know them? Acts chapter 5. But a certain man named Ananias, with Sapphira his wife, sold the possession and kept back part of the price. His wife also being privy to it and brought a certain part and laid it at the apostles' feet. But Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled thine heart to lie to the Holy Ghost and to keep back part of the price of the land? Who did Ananias lie to in the text? The Holy Ghost. Verse 4, while it remained, was it not thine own? And after it was sold, was it not in thine own power? Why hast thou conceived this thing in thine heart? Thou hast not lied unto men, but unto God. God. Verse 3, he lied to the Holy Ghost. Verse 4, he lied to God. Put these two verses together. The Holy Ghost is God. Amen. 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 And there's many more scriptures. We could go over 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 10 and 11 says, The Holy Spirit knows everything God the Father knows. Now, if God the Father is omniscient, means he knows everything, that means the Holy Spirit knows everything. And if the God the Father is eternal, the Holy Spirit is eternal. In Genesis 1, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And we see in verse 2 that the Holy Spirit moved upon the waters. The Holy Spirit can create. The Holy Spirit can tell the future. The Holy Spirit is God. And we must be mindful how we speak about the Holy Spirit. It is many times people just speak about the Holy Spirit in a certain way and it's not calling reverence. The Holy Spirit is God. Amen. Now, I will give you a definition for the sin against the Holy Spirit, the unpardonable sin. Please listen very carefully. The sin of blasphemy against the Holy Spirit does not lie in any sudden word or deed. It is the firm determined resistance of truth and evidence. It is not a one-time thing. This is a constant lifestyle which you are living whereby you are resisting truth and evidence. One other definition. The sin against the Holy Ghost is the sin of persistent refusal to respond to the invitation to repent. So if you don't repent, that means your sins stay upon you and they are not forgiven because they are not repented of. And it is the Holy Spirit work to convict our hearts. If you don't confess the sin, how can God forgive the sin? A life of consistent rebellion against God. That is the sin against the Holy Ghost. Now in Mark chapter 3, Mark chapter 3 verse 29, where Mark speaks about this unpardonable sin. In Mark 3 verse 29, here's how Mark speaks about it. But he that shall blaspheme against the Holy Ghost hath never forgiveness, but is in danger of eternal damnation. You see? He's in danger. By constantly going along that path, you're in danger of eternal damnation. Because they said, he hath an unclean spirit. You see, the Pharisees were there 
every time when Jesus was working these miracles, the Pharisees, the religious leaders were seeing all these things. Seeing men raising, raised from the dead, the raising of Lazarus, people blind being healed. They saw all this, but they so were such stubbornness. They resisted the Holy Ghost so much so that they got to the point to see Jesus cast out a demon, make a blind person see, and a dumb person speak and say, that's of the devil. They got so far against resisting their heart to the Holy Spirit that they said that, and by saying that, Jesus said, you are committing the unpardonable sin. Now, let's see the Holy Spirit work in our lives. John chapter 16. John chapter 16. This is where Jesus speaks about the Holy Ghost. John chapter 16. And Jesus spoke a lot about the Holy Spirit. In John 14, 15, and 16, you'll find the most. But in John 16, we'll start at verse 7. Here's Jesus speaking. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. truth. It is expedient for you that I go away. For if I go not away, the Comforter will not come unto you. But if I depart, I will send him unto you. And when he is come, notice, Jesus referred to the Holy Spirit as he, as a person. And when he is come, he will reprove the world of sin. Reprove means convict. He will convict the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. Of sin because they believe not on me. Not believing in Jesus is sin. So let's go to 1 John 1 verse 9. You may know this from your heart. 1 John 1 verse 9 says, If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Jesus is willing to forgive. But the first word in verse 9 is what? If. What happens if you do not confess? You see, you're going along the pathway of committing the unpardonable sin if you do not confess. But now many times when we think of confession, we say, Oh Lord, forgive me of my sins. And then tomorrow comes, you do the same sin again. And then the next day comes, you do the same sin again. And you say, Lord, forgive me. That is not confession according to the Bible. Let's go to Proverbs chapter 28 and find out what true confession is. Because if we do not confess the right way, our sins will not be forgiven. There is a right way and a wrong way to ask for forgiveness. Proverbs chapter 28, we're looking at verse 13. Proverbs chapter 28, verse 13. Is it found? Psalms, Proverbs, Proverbs 28, verse 13. He that covereth his sins shall not prosper. If you cover your sins up, you just don't confess them, you cover your sins, you shall not prosper. But whosoever confesseth and forsaketh then shall have mercy. So if you want God to be merciful to us, we need to confess the sin and forsake the sin. Have a hatred for the sin, stop doing the sin. Because if we continue sinning and asking forgiveness in that manner, that is not true confession, that is presumption. Now let's go to Psalm 19, verse 13, and see what the Bible speaks about presumption. Psalm 19, verse 13, David says, Keep back thy servant also from presumptuous sins. Let them not have dominion over me, then I shall be upright, and I shall be innocent from the great transgression. What do you think a great transgression is? Unpardonable sin. God bless you. Correct. By going through that, oh, Jesus will forgive me, forgive me, but I don't change. I just keep living the same lifestyle. And because God is love, he would must forgive my sins, but I could keep doing it. Not. That is not repentance. That is not true confession. And true forgiveness will not take place under that manner. Because our iniquities, the Bible says, has separated us from God. So we need to stop the sin. Now, John chapter 16, verse 10, we learned about sin. But also it said, the Holy Spirit convicts us of sin and of righteousness because I go to my Father and you see me no more. When Jesus was alive working all these miracles, the disciples could see him. Amen? Amen. And they could see all these wonderful works and see 
what a true godly life is all about just by looking at Jesus. But Jesus ascended to heaven. Amen? Amen. They could see him no more. So since Jesus ascended to heaven, he sent the Holy Ghost to talk to our hearts and say, you want to know how to live? Follow the example of Jesus. And how do we know to follow the example of Jesus? By reading his word. That is how we can follow the example of Jesus, which is a life of righteousness. But if we still refuse to follow after the example of Christ, what else does the Holy Spirit do? Can we prove of, of judgment? See, there's nothing else the Holy Spirit can do because you do not confess your sin, and if you don't follow the example of Christ, He has to convict your heart about judgment. Why? Because the prince of this world is judge. Satan violated God's law. Satan committed an unpardonable sin. Satan will be judged and destroyed in a lake of fire. If any person refuse to repent and refuse to confess their sins, they will have the same fate as Satan and will be destroyed with him in the lake of fire. It's that serious when you reject the Holy Ghost. Because the Holy Spirit is the one who is working upon our hearts. And God loves us all. And God loves us so much that he sent the Holy Spirit to speak to our conscience. You know your conscience is evidence that God exists? Amen. If God did not exist, why would you have a voice telling you this is wrong? How would that, why would that come about if we just came along by this ridiculous theory of evolution? Just conscience itself is evidence of God. Amen. And your conscience speaks to you day by day. You may be driving along the road and the Holy Spirit says, don't go this way. And the next thing you know, there was an accident right there. And you could have been in that accident. Or a person just zoomed right by and that could have hit you. The Holy Spirit is speaking to us through our conscience. Amen. Now let's go to the book of Ephesians. The Holy Spirit loves us so much. Jesus loves us so much for sending the Holy Spirit. And we need to respond when he speaks to us. We're in Ephesians chapter 4 verse 30. But if we do not listen to the Holy Spirit, what happens? Verse 30, Ephesians 4 verse 30. And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby ye are sealed unto the day of redemption. When he speaks to our hearts, and we do not confess our sins, and we do not change our lifestyles to be in accordance with God's will, it hurts God. Amen. Because the Holy Spirit is God. And it says in verse 30, grieve not the Holy Spirit. Can you imagine you can be a Christian and say, I love God and I love Jesus so much, but at the same time living a life of sin, you're hurting God? Because you can say you love Jesus, but you're hurting the Holy Spirit, and both individuals are God. Brothers and sisters, we need to listen to the Holy Spirit. Now, let's go to Hebrews chapter 10. We learned that we can grieve the Holy Spirit. Now, if we, now, in Hebrews chapter 10, let's start at verse 26. Hebrews 10, verse 26. The Holy Spirit speaketh to our hearts. For if we sin willfully, after that we have received the knowledge of the truth, there remaineth no more sacrifice for sins but a certain fearful looking for of judgment and of fiery indignation which shall devour the adversaries. He that despised Moses' law died without mercy under two or three witnesses. Of how much more sore punishment suppose ye shall be thought worthy who had trodden underfoot the Son of God and had counted the blood of the covenant wherewith he was sanctified an unholy thing and hath done despite unto the spirit of grace. That word despite means to despise. You can despise the Holy Spirit by not listening to him. The way how we can respond can bring us closer to Jesus or farther away from Jesus. Acts chapter 7 verse 51. Now we'll see how these individuals act to the response of the Holy Ghost. In Acts 7, we have Stephen. Does, we know Stephen? Yeah. Stephen was a deacon filled to the max with the Holy Ghost. So much so that when he was preaching, his face was glowing. Can you imagine that? 
you're a light about your face, so much so that you're filled with the Holy Spirit. And he's preaching to the Jews in front of the Sanhedrin leaders, talking about how the history of Israel, how one by one they had a life of constant rebellion against God. And he's telling them, do not resist the Holy Ghost. And he comes to the end of his sermon and says in verse 51, Acts 7 verse 51, Ye stiff neck and uncircumcised in hearts and ears, you do always resist the Holy Ghost as your fathers did, so do ye. Now he said that to them, and in verse 54, when they heard these things, they were cut to the heart, conviction upon every one of them who heard Stephen preach, they were cut to the heart and they gnashed on him with their teeth. And then, if you read the passage, they stoned him to death. The Holy Spirit convicts their heart. They're cut to the heart. But what do they do? They get angry and kill the messenger. But what happens is, by them killing the messenger, the messenger was just a spokesperson for God. They didn't want to have anything to do with the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit was speaking through Stephen. Now, let's see a different reaction to the preaching of the gospel in Acts 2. In Acts 2, we have Peter preaching on the day of Pentecost. Amen? Now, verse 37, just a few chapters back, Peter preached. Now, verse 37 says, Now, when they heard this, they were pricked in their heart and said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren... What shall we do? Then Peter said unto them, what's, that, what's the next word? Repent. Repent. Of course the Holy Spirit would say repent. And be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus, for the remission of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Holy Ghost. For the promise is come unto you, and to your children, and to all that are afar off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. Now when you drop down to verse 41, Praise the Lord. Verse 41 says, Then they that gladly received his words were baptized, and the same day there were added unto them about 3,000 souls. Amen. Praise the Lord. Amen. When you respond to the preaching of the word by someone filled with the Holy Ghost, salvation. When you reject it like the Jews did in Acts 7, you have condemnation. Now there was a time in earth's history where the entire world except a few committed the unpardonable sin now let's look at that in genesis chapter 3 genesis chapter 3 first book of the bible genesis chapter 3 verse 1 and it came to pass when men began to multiply on the face of the earth and daughters were born unto them that the sons of God saw the daughters of men, that they were fair, and took them wives of all which they chose. Genesis chapter 6? Six? Sorry, Genesis 6? Reading from verse 1, sorry. Genesis 6, verse 1 and 2. We're in verse 3 now. Genesis 6, verse 3. And the Lord said, My spirit shall not always strive with man, for that he also is flesh, Yet his days shall be 120 years. Noah preached for 120 years to the people who lived before the flood. And how many people got onto the ark? Eight people. Noah, his wife, his three sons, and their wives. Eight people. And the whole earth was filled with violence. Now, let's think. If you live to be 900 years, how many children can you have? <laughs> Hundreds. Some of us may have, I have a lot of aunts and uncles. Some of you may have family members who have had 16 children. But they might have lived up to 90 years old. But if you can live up to 900 years old, imagine that. And every single person was lost except for those eight. Preaching for 120 years. And let me show you how they resisted the Holy Ghost. Noah preaching, they made fun of him, it never rained, oh, it's, the flood's not going to happen. Then the animals walk on the ark. Evidence that they can visually see. No, I'm not going to get on the ark. 
they rejecting, they are rejecting, they are rejecting, then the door closes. What do they do? Look, it's not raining, they're making fun of Noah inside. Seven days pass, then the rain falls, and they see that Noah was right. So what did these people do? All the time, for 120 years, hardening their hearts to the preaching of Noah. And the Bible says Noah was a preacher of righteousness. He was a righteous man. They resisted the Holy Ghost so much so that who knows how many people there were, but could it be millions or maybe even billions, whoever, however, how much they were, all lost by committing the unpardonable sin. This is so serious, brothers and sisters. It is so serious. So we do not want to commit this unpardonable sin. Not at all. When the Holy Spirit speaks to us, we need to respond and not do what it says in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 19. I'll just read it quickly. It says, quench not the Holy Spirit. Now, what, when you quench something, what do you do? You put it out. If you have a candle lit and you quench the fire, you put it out. Now, sin is like fire and the Holy Spirit. Sin is like water, and the Holy Spirit in the Bible is spoken of many times as fire. Right? So continuing in a life of sin is putting out the fire of the Holy Spirit in your life. Don't quench the fire of the Holy Spirit by, repeated, by repeatedly refusing to listen to his invitation to repent. And if the fire goes out, you've reached the point of no return. Can you imagine you're alive and you are lost, and there is nothing that God the Father, God the Son, the Holy Spirit, or all the angels in heavens can do. You have resisted God so much that God who has omnipotent power cannot save you. And how do you think God feels about that? When he sees men and women constantly resisting him. You may invite the people to church, you might tell people to change their lives, their sin, to come back to God, I don't want to hear it. I don't want to hear it. What do they do? They just shun it. And that is continually resisting the Holy Ghost. And a person can go so far that it's not the Holy Spirit stop reaching them, but they have hardened their hearts so much so that they be refusing and refusing and refusing. There's nothing more that God can do. An example would be by a person standing up and every time he commits sin and the Holy Spirit convicts him, he says, no, a brick is laid down. Then he does it again. A brick is laid down. By so many being bricks being piled up, a wall comes up. The Holy Spirit is still speaking to him, but the wall is there that he cannot even hear it. Or you have an alarm clock. It goes off. It rings, rings, rings to wake up. You hit snooze. Yeah, rings, rings, rings. Five minutes later, you hit snooze. You can do this so repeatedly that the alarm can go off and you can't even hear it. By constantly resisting it is you can be committing, in a sense, an example of committing the unpardonable sin. By not taking heed and following how the Holy Spirit leads us. And the Bible not only says you can quench the Holy Spirit, in 1 Timothy 4 verse 2, it says that you can also, we saw that the Holy Spirit speaks to our conscience. Amen? Amen. But in 1 Timothy 4 verse 2, it says, speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a hot iron. You can sear your conscience so much so that God cannot reach you. It's having your conscience seared with a hot iron, burnt. Brothers and sisters, when light comes, we must accept the light. Because God wants us to be saved, but God cannot save us against our wills. We have to cooperate with him. And in John 12, verse 35, Jesus said, Yet a little while, while the light is with you, walk while ye have the light, lest darkness come upon you. For he that walketh in darkness knoweth not whither he goeth. By resisting the Holy Spirit, you are leading a life whereby you are in darkness. Now the last text is Proverbs chapter 4, verse 18. Proverbs chapter 4, verse 18. Proverbs chapter 4, verse 18, which says, But the path of the just is as the shining light 
that shineth more and more unto the perfect day. What the Holy Spirit will for our lives, and He is the Spirit of truth, He guides us into all truth. The Holy Spirit wants, when you hear a message, or when you study God's Word, if it goes contrary to the way that you are living, to repent and make the changes. So that the light will shine, and it will shine more and more unto the perfect day. So that when Christ comes, we can be saved. So this is what the Holy Spirit wants. We are, as Christians, always to be growing and growing and growing. But if we're not growing, what are we doing? We're declining. And we saw that Jesus says, you cannot serve God and man. You cannot, it's only God or the devil. There's no middle ground. By not making a decision for God, you've made a decision for Satan. Now, when you see in the scriptures, the Bible talks about Pharaoh. Ten plagues were poured out upon Egypt. But how did Pharaoh respond? Pharaoh hardened his heart. And he hardened his heart. He saw God working and he hardened his heart. And when he hardened his heart, so much so that when the Red Sea was parted for the Jews to pass through, he presumptuously ran through and the entire Egyptian army was destroyed. Pharaoh will be lost. The Bible gives, speaks about a man named Felix. The Apostle Paul, filled with the Holy Ghost, spoke and preached to Felix. Felix trembled under conviction. But Felix's response to that conviction was, when I have a convenient season, I will come. He put it off. And the Bible never speaks again about Felix. Felix, rejecting Paul, filled with the Holy Ghost, committed the unpardonable sin. Felix is lost. The Bible speaks about Judas. Judas was one of the twelve. Judas saw the miracles of Christ, so much so, but yet Judas sold out our Lord for money. Money was his God. And then, what happened to Judas? The Bible says he hung himself. Many times you commit the unpardonable sin and God leaves you. Well, you leave God. There's nothing more that God can do. And the devil has full control and many times people commit suicide. When you see rappers and artists and movie stars committing suicide, it could very well be that they have committed the unpardonable sin by reject, resisting God. Why so many of them die these deaths of suicide, many of them. And King Agrippa was another man. Paul preached to him. Well, you know what King Agrippa said to the preaching of Paul? Almost pers thou persuadest me to be a Christian. We have examples in scripture of men and women who have so resisted the Holy Ghost that they are lost. And God cannot save them. And there was one other man by the name of Saul, the first king of Israel. He resisted and resisted so much so that he became demon-possessed, whereby D David had to play music for him, and the demon would flee. And he went so far that it says in Scripture, in 1 Samuel 28, verse 6, the Lord answered him not anymore. And he also committed suicide. So the Holy Spirit, if the Holy Spirit has been speaking to your heart today, and you have never given your life to Christ and you want to surrender your life to Christ today, I'm asking you just to raise your hand. Just to raise your hand. I see two hands raised. Is there another? Please keep your hand raised so that the ushers can see you and take notice. If the Holy Spirit has convicted your heart today and you want to say to God today, I am going to surrender my heart completely, just raise your hand. God bless you. You know right now heaven is rejoicing? You know the Holy Spirit is smiling right now? The Holy Spirit, God the Father, all the angels in heaven are smiling. Why? Because people have made decisions for Christ. Praise the Lord. Now maybe you have given your life to Christ, but you know you've drifted. You've wandered. You don't read your Bibles anymore. You don't pray anymore. The things of this world have become first in your life. God 
is this much in your life where things of this world is everything to you. Your God could maybe be your house, could maybe be your job, it could maybe even be your friends. Anything that takes up your time and your emotions where God is not first is a God. Now if there's someone here today, you have surrendered your life, but the Holy Spirit is calling you today to a, con to a commitment today, and you're saying, Holy Spirit, I'm coming home. Just raise your hand. You've drifted. We see one hand raised up here. God bless you. Two, another hand raised up here. God bless you. Another one here. God bless you. The Holy Spirit is touching hearts. God bless you. My next appeal is there's someone here today who has never been baptized. The Bible says you must be born of the water and of the Spirit. Born of the water means we must be baptized. As Christ was baptized in the River Jordan, we are to be baptized in the water and come out of the water. And baptism is so powerful. When you get married, you invite all your friends, everyone to come for this joyous occasion. And by being baptized, it's a public occasion to show the world that you have chosen God and no longer Satan as the ruler of your life. You switch sides and you do this publicly so that everyone can see it and they can make that decision. If you want to be baptized, please raise your hand for baptism. We have one hand raised up here in the front, another hand raised in the front. God bless you both. God bless you both. And the hand in the back. Oh, God bless you. Praise the Lord for baptism. When people are baptized, the Holy Spirit comes into their heart and He leads them and gives them power to live a life victorious. God bless you. But maybe you've been baptized and you've also have backslidden. You've broken your covenant with God and you no longer find joy in spiritual things. You've gone back to the life of the old man. You've drifted. But you want to say, Lord, I want to come back home. I have been baptized, but I want to come back home. Please raise your hand. We have a hand in the back. Is there another? Oh, God bless you all. God bless you all. But maybe you just came here today and you want to learn more. This is all new to you and you want to learn more about the truth as it is in Jesus. And you just want someone to study with you so you can learn more about the gospel. Please raise your hand for Bible studies and prayer. For Bible studies and prayer. Is there anyone who just wants to learn more? These are new things that you are learning and you want to learn more. Please raise your hand. God bless you. God bless you. Is there another? Just, God bless you. Just for a closer walk with Christ. The scripture says that when the Holy Spirit speaks, harden not your hearts. Amen? Amen? Let us not harden our hearts. So if there's anyone, I just want to give a little more time. The Holy Spirit has been speaking to